Welcome to the Good Fight Radio Show with pastor and author Joe Schimmel, bringing you vital and uncompromised truths that you will not hear in the mainstream media, discussing contemporary issues in light of the Bible and how these issues relate to family, culture, and the church. The heart of this show is to glorify Jesus Christ and expose the works of darkness as he commanded in Ephesians 5.11. God states in his word that he would rise up ministries in the last days to do mighty exploits that would turn many to righteousness. Now here with vital insights from God's word is pastor and author Joe Schimmel. First Peter chapter five, verse eight. Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. We talked about being sober uh, last time, sober-minded, but he calls us to be sober-minded, a sober in spirit, be on the alert because our enemy, our adversary, that's enemy, the devil, Diabolos, we speak of the uh, Satanas, we speak of the uh, accuser of the brethren. Satan means opposer. Devil means accuser or slanderer, and he prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And I want to talk to you this evening about one of his biggest tactics that I think that we need to be aware of, and that many Christians need to be aware of, that many Christians aren't aware of it, and that is, and if we miss this, we miss the whole need for Jesus, and that is the enemy has such a toehold in much of the church and getting the church to think that really, you know, we need Jesus for different things. We need God for different things. But guess what? We don't really need the forgiveness of our sins. Or we're not really that bad. We need him to help rectify our situation or what have you. But, you know, our, our plight isn't really that bad. In fact, I was reading an article that caught my eye and it was like Rod Stewart's ex-wife gets, gets through life because of her faith, you know? It was in a secular news outlet. I thought, oh, I wonder what they're going to say about her faith. Is it faith in Christ? You know, what are, you, know you don't usually see that. And as I started to read the article, you know, I thought, oh, wow. You know, she's talking about her best friend, Fair Fawcett and stuff. And I thought, okay, interesting kind of article. And where's it, when's it going to get to her faith? So I just kind of scanned through it to look for this faith issue. And she talks about how, you know, ever since she was young, she was brought up with a grandmother that was very strict but very... God fearing, you know, and that she taught her the Bible, and that she's never she's never strayed from those core convictions she learned from the Bible. And I thought, wow, okay, so far so good. And then she says, and I had a hard time accepting myself when I was young, because and sadly it was a sad testimony in regard to when she was young. Her her dad had uh, left, she'd never seen her dad, and then her mom had OD'd on drugs. And yeah, that would be sad. But then she said she realized, then when she realized the spiritual aspect, ther- through th- therapy and her spirituality, she came to understand that God sees all of us as perfect. And that really, you know, she was saying there's, that sin's not a problem. Like, we're not really sinners because, not, not in God's eyes, God sees everybody as perfect. Is that biblical? No. And I was like, oh, Lord God, you know, you... You think, okay, oh, wow, wow, Jesus might be, li- be li- you know, getting lifted up here on a secular news site. And then my heart just sunk. I was like, oh, man, do we really understand? I mean, can we really have the gospel if, you know, God sees us as perfect? How does God see us? And I want to let you know this is important because one of the enemy's greatest tactics is to get us to believe that we're not sinners. In 1 John, many of you know that John is dealing with what kind of, what group of insurrectionist or, or what kind of cultic group was infiltrating the church that First John was writing to there in Ephesus? Anybody remember? The Gnostics. And you remember the Gnostics believed that there was no sin because if you revolted against Yahweh, the creator, that's a good thing because Yahweh was, you know, even though he was our creator, he wasn't really the ultimate God and he was trying to hem us in, right? So First John, we read this in verses 8 through 10. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Now, if somebody believes that they have not sinned, they don't realize, they don't believe that they need 
to be saved from their sin, amen? Or if somebody believes that everybody is perfect in God's eyes, how in the world are you going to share Jesus as a Savior of the world with them, amen? And that's why throughout the Scripture, there's an emphasis on reality. We've got to live in realville, okay? We can't be, you know, pretending that this is the way, because, you know, we have such a high opinion of the human race, you know? We want to believe that, you know, everything's sweet and nice, but it's not. We know we lock our doors. We know children from their infancy, you know? Kids, kids can be really tough. And we know our prison systems are filled and, and everything else. We know there's a problem, man. There's a real problem with sin. But Satan is the father of lies, and he wants us to believe we can come to God in all these different ways. And he doesn't want us to believe that we're sinners. Or if we do believe we're sinners, he doesn't want us to believe that we could be saved. Or he wants us to believe we could be saved through what? Works righteousness, right? Or Mormonism, or through the watchtower, or, or through some other path. But he, he's, he's the enemy of our soul. So I think it's important that we understand that we need to have victory over the schemes of the enemy. 2 Corinthians 2.11 says that uh, Paul says we're not ignorant of the devil's devices. One of his greatest devices, and that's what he did through Gnosticism. Gnosticism denied sin in the human race and claimed to represent Christianity, claimed to represent Jesus. Okay, that was one of Satan's early lies. That's why 1 John 2, or 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 through 10, was written to combat this lie. But today, it's a very powerful lie as well. I mean, how often do you hear people at work when they're talking about things use the word sin? How often do you hear people at school, unless they're your brothers and sisters in Christ and you fellowship with them and you have a Bible club, but I'm talking about the teacher, other students just talking about sin. They don't want to talk about sin. They don't want it to be something where they've actually offended a thrice holy God and broken his holy law. The Bible says sin is transgression of the law in 1 John. Isn't it interesting that one of the best definitions of sin we have is in 1 John? Why do you think that is? Because it's combated the Gnostics. He's letting us know that, guess what? Our God has given us a law, and sin is transgression of that law. Now, it's interesting for this new radio show we have, we're on a topic dealing with the culture of death, confronting the culture of death. So since the school shootings have just been rampant in our country, and they don't seem to be turning around, I, look, I, I jotted down 15 different things that people blame for the rash of school shootings. One of the things that I wrote down was mental illness. A lot of people think, well, Adam Lanza was mentally ill. And the idea, and I'm not saying he didn't have mental illness. Guess what? I found out, folks, reading the scripture, everybody has a degree of mental illness. Every time we blow it in sin, we don't use our mental faculties in the right way. And we're sick, the Bible teaches, from head to toe. Amen? Now, granted, there are other specific, you know, things that are categorized as mental illness, but sometimes people use mental illness as a license to exonerate people from responsibility. For instance, an in insanity in plea in a court of law has sprung many a person. However, Adam Lanza, I believe, knew what he was doing. I don't have any doubt about it. I, don't, I mean, he was calculating. He shot his mother in the face. That's a statement. The FBI is trying to piece together his hard drive because he destroyed it before he went on his murder spree. He was trying to hide something. Okay, I think that's evident. He was a thinking person. He was calculating in his evil. That's sin, folks. Now you can say that he had a mental illness to go along with his sinful nature, but he had a sinful nature that he acted out upon. In fact, I was reading a testimony that was reported in the Daily Mail a few weeks ago. By the way, have you heard the big report about what Adam Lanza was all about? Did it even come out? We're talking how many, what's it, a month plus now or something? And we're still waiting to find out what the police found out? I know, I know personally to be very careful about what I hear even after, from the media, but also even from law enforcement to a degree. There's some great people in law enforcement. Praise God for them. But I know when I interviewed Cassie Bernal's father, and I flew to Colorado, and I interviewed him for They Sold Their Souls for Rock and Roll, because I myself was already showing in a video we were putting together, Ramstein singing about going into the schoolyard and bloodying, killing people and bloodying up, bloodying up their clothes and everything else. And this, these guys were radically into Ramstein. And Ramstein was interviewed by MTV. Okay, they were into you guys. Do you have any songs that would uh, encourage us? No, all of our songs are about love and the different nuances of love. Really? 
That's just a bold-faced lie that was reported on MTV. I knew there was a lot more going on. And when I interviewed Cassie Bernal's dad, and that's in the 10-hour version, probably have him maybe almost 25 minutes in that version. And I play, I play audio tape of Clay Bolden Harris, who were involved in the Columbine murders, specifically stating that they're going to go after kids that have the what would Jesus do bracelets on, which were popular then. Now the media was saying, oh, they hated jocks. They were made fun of and da 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 da. They didn't, they didn't talk about how they're going to go down to the gym and kill jocks. They went to the library and they went after believers wherever they could find them. I'm not saying that was your only motive. There was a lot of things at work. We know that Eric Harris was into Darwinism and survival of the fittest. I talked about that before. Just read an interesting, interesting quote by a lawyer who represented six of the families of, of six of the children that were killed at Columbine. And he said, well, I went through all of Eric Harris's writings and everything they shot, him and Claybold, and everything they wrote. And, and it was real clear that he was a full-blown Darwinist and that, that, that helped motivate or that was behind a lot of what we, he thought he was doing. You didn't hear that in the media. You didn't hear they were going after uh, Christians. You know, what would Jesus do in the mainstream media? I didn't hear it. But guess what? When I asked Cassie's dad about it, he, he got teary-eyed. He said, you know what? All of us parents that lost kids, we walked through this with law enforcement. And it was clear to every, every one of us knew they were going after Christians. That was a big part of it. But when it came out to the media and they reported to the media, that didn't come out. That was hidden. That was covered up. He says that in the video. And I don't believe the enemy wants to know us, us to know what's really going on. Thank God we have the scripture, amen. Thank God we could read that. We have a fallen nature and it's wicked, it's sinful. And Lonza's friend, and this came out in the Daily Mail, but it wasn't reported on widely. But one of his school, uh, one of his school friends, stated that Adam Lanza had a devil worshiping site, and this was reported in the Daily Mail. You can just Google Daily Mail Lanza devil worshiping, and and where he had uh, devil writ- written in red Gothic style letters with a black background. Trevor L. Todd is his friend's name from the past, and he said it was weird and gave him the chills. Well, how, how much did you hear that, you know? And why aren't we being told what this guy was about? I think part of the reason is the scapegoat is to deal with issues that will further agendas. In fact, one of the things on the list of being blamed, probably more than anything else in the media, is guns. And we have Second Amendment rights to bear arms, to protect ourselves, if you look at that amendment. And we're one of the few countries on the planet that actually has that right. Did you know that? to protect ourselves from a tyrannical government. Now, I'm not here advocating one thing or another on that, in regard to that issue, although I'm thankful that we have the right to protect ourselves and our families. However, I am here to say there's a lot of issues that are being ignored. And one of the issues you did not hear very often in the media, everything was being blamed, mental illness, uh, guns, all these different things, but one one of the things they forgot to blame was Adam Lanza, you know? You know what I'm saying? Isn't that a blow mind? It's because he had this, or because he had access to his mother's gun. What about the human race? What about not just Adam Lanza? What about all of us that we have sinful hearts? And you can try to protect people from people that have a bona fide mental illness as it's based on the criteria of those who are making decisions. But guess what? There's an old cartoon where the character says, Pogo, I believe it is. We've met the enemy, and it is us. We're the ones with the problem. The human race has an incredible problem called sin, and we can't blame God. You're listening to a message by pastor and author Joe Schimmel on the Good Fight Radio Show. To learn more about Good Fight Ministries, please visit goodfightradio.org to find many of Pastor Joe's full Sunday morning teachings. James chapter 1, I want you to go there. Well, don't go there. We're going to go to a lot of verses. I'll just read it to you. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone, but each one is tempted when he, when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Don't be deceived by sin. Don't be dele- deceived in thinking that sin won't bring, you, bring death to you. That's why you need to repent of sin and put our faith in Jesus. Amen. So the, the problem is us, and you can't blame God when you're tempted or say God's tempting you because he's righteous, he's good. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights, amen? There's no sin or no evil in him. He's absolutely perfect. But since he has given us free will, we have the capacity to choose against him, against his will. And whenever we choose 
against God, we choose sin. And that's part of our fallen human nature, isn't it? The first sinner's name was what? Adam. Adam Lanza belonged to the Adams family. You ever watch the Adams family when you were a little kid? It tried to make horror characters look hip, tried to make them look cool, the monsters, yeah. They dressed nice and everything, and it put a spin on evil. That evil could be refined. It can look good. It's not all that bad. It can be, you know, but guess what? We're part of the Adams family, but we're all descendants of Adam. Original sin, it's, original sin goes back to Adam's original rebellion against God as the federal head of our race who represented all of us rebelled against God. And we've inherited his sinful nature. We have. Now, if a child dies, when a baby's born, they've inherited that fallen nature. If a baby dies, the Catholic Church says, hey, they're sinners, they're guilty because of original sin, and therefore they must be baptized in the Catholic Church or they go to limbo, which is like hell. Well, the Bible teaches that in Ezekiel chapter 18, that we're not accountable for somebody else's sin, that nobody could say, hey, the children's teeth are set on edge because of the sins of the fathers. However, the Bible also teaches original sin, and that is that we inherit a sinful nature and that we're accountable for our own sin. He says the soul that sins will die. However, a child, as we know, who falls short of God's glory and sins isn't convicted before God as a rebel against God until that child reaches the age of what? Accountability. That's why David could say that he knew he'd be with his child again that died at birth. That's why the children of those parents who rebelled against God in the wilderness, the children were able to go into the promised land. That's why God pleads with uh, Jonah and his heart, because Jonah doesn't want to preach to the Ninevites because he doesn't want God to spare them. And he reminds them that there's thousands of children there that don't know their left hand from their right, that aren't accountable. That's why in Romans 7, Paul says that when he's a child, he said, I didn't know what sin was until the law came and I became aware of sin. But as soon as children become aware that they're offending God and they're in rebellion to him, they're accountable. And I say this because it's important that we understand what the Bible teaches in regard to original sin. We're accountable for our own sin. However, there's something pretty heavy going on with Adam because Adam did represent us. He was our champion. Just like Goliath represented the Philistines, and David represented God's army because he was a man after God's own heart. And that he's a picture of Jesus facing Antichrist because Goliath had, you know, you know, there's a whole picture that I don't want to get into. It's pretty heavy. Goliath was a radical picture of Antichrist. He represented the Philistines. Adam was our champion. He represented humanity. If you would have put Frank, Tom, Bob, Joe in Adam's place, we would have all blown it. Because Adam's name means man. Amen. So you say, well, why am I being blamed for Adam's sin? Well, guess what? We have this term we use in theology called corporate solidarity. Corporate solidarity. Think of corporation. Think of solidarity, something solid. That we're the mass of humanity. And we aren't being held responsible for Adam's sin. We are responsible for our own sin. However, we inherit a sinful nature because we're part of humanity. And I can tell you right now, not one of us would have passed the test. The Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. In Revelation chapter 5, when John's weeping because there's nobody that's overcome, there's nobody that can take the scroll in heaven or on earth or under the earth, then Jesus is the one that steps forth, except Jesus, amen? He's the champion, amen? There's a second Adam, amen? So he's the second Adam. But it doesn't matter. Now, humanity, we want, you know, you got what we call secular humanism. You know, we could pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps, we are righteous. We can create a new world order and there'll be peace and the UN's fighting for world peace, which is kind of amazing because the United Nations, I mean, they've had, got all kinds of problems with United Nation uh, troops being guilty sometimes of rape, mass rape, all kinds of things. Humanity is the problem, guys. Now, God does say in Romans chapter 13 that he supplied government to, op to suppress evil. If there wasn't government folk, guess what? There would be anarchy. Everybody would just be killing everybody. So that's one of the main purposes of government is to suppress evil. So we're not against government. We thank God for government, but we don't want too much of it. Amen? And you also don't want too little of it to where you can't call the police. if You're in danger. Some people want more government. Some people want less government. And I thank God that I'm looking for the perfect government. That's when Jesus Christ returns. Amen? 
to defeat this anti the Antichrist and the world system and everything else. But we have to keep in mind, no matter what kind of spin the world puts on itself, we are not to trust man, that man is the problem. To me, the main problem, you could look at 15, 20, 25, 50, 100 different things that make this culture that we live in dark, and many of them which were influential on Adam Lanz and the other school shooters, guess what the main thing is? Fallen human nature. That's the main culprit. Because when Adam rebelled against God, and he was created in God's image, if you look at Luke, I think it's around 338, it talks about, you know, it brings the genealogy all the way back to Adam, and it says so-and-so was the son of so-and-so, so-and-so was the son of so-and-so, and Adam was the son of God. He was created in his image. But then you see Adam bear a child, and it talks about how this child was born in, his, in the image of Adam. And we share the image of Adam's fallenness now. We have a fallen human nature. This is vital that we understand. Because the Bible teaches that we were created good. Ecclesiastes says that he made us upright, made us good. Genesis chapter 2. And then we fell. So the Bible teaches devolution. Except Satan, one of his big lies is evolution. We start out as slime, but we are ascending to godhood or a superman race or what have you, depending on the, the Darwinists you talk to. Some are more modest and say, no, we're just animals, but hey, we've still come a long way, baby. And it's all backwards, and it's a lie as though we're getting better and better. When the Bible says we're getting worse and worse, 2 Timothy 3.13, amen? And Jesus said lawlessness would increase. And we have to watch out because, man, you can dress up a pig, and you could dress up a dog, and it might look cute and everything, but it's a pig and it's a dog. And humanity is in huge trouble. In fact, Jesus, dealing with the religious leaders, the Pharisees of his day, he said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside they are full of robbery and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and of the dish, so that the outside of it may be clean also. Then he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they are full of dead men's bones, and all uncleanness. So you two outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. That's why Jesus said our righteousness must supersede the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees or we're going to enter heaven. You see, there was an internal problem, the sinful nature, the depravity of man. I do believe in total depravity and what the Bible teaches regarding total depravity. That sin and the fall has affected the total aspect of our humanity. Body, soul, spirit, mind, it's all affected totally. No doubt about it. So when we say total depravity, I use the term total depravity because I do believe that we are totally depraved just like the Calvinist. I just happen to believe that God doesn't will that any would perish and that he draws all men to himself and the grace that brings salvation appears to all men and that he is not partial but he's sincere in his offer of salvation to everybody It's important for us to understand that the Bible teaches that man has this horrific sin problem all the way back in Genesis chapter 3 we see man's fall and then we read look at chapter 51 of the book of Psalms and it's important that we understand this because many Christians have left what the Bible teaches about original sin and our inherent evil from the fall of Adam and we cannot depart from orthodox teaching in regard to Christianity because we'll end up in a, in a mess of problems. I'll go to 58. Go to 58, verse 3. Psalm 58, verse 3. The wicked are estranged from what? From the womb. These who speak lies go astray from where? From birth. They go astray from birth. Now back up to Psalm 51. Look what David says in verse 5 when he's repenting of, of his adultery with Bathsheba, after he's confronted by the prophet Nathan. Behold, he says, I was brought forth in what? In iniquity and a sin, my mother, what? Conceive me. Brothers and sisters, when we're conceived, man, we partake of the human race and we share that carpet solidarity of, of fallenness. Now we also share the great potential of becoming children of God because of the grace of God, Amen. So we're sinners, 
Yes, but there's great hope because we have such a good God who instead of wiping us out, wants to see us saved, amen? Wants to redeem us. But we can't really appreciate and understand the good news until we hear the bad news, amen? We can't appreciate Jesus as much as we should until we understand Moses, amen? And the law and how we're sinful and that we need God's grace in Jesus. The law came through Moses, it says in John 1, but grace and truth through Jesus. And go to Genesis chapter 6. This is after the fall took place in Genesis chapter 3. And then we read in Genesis chapter 6. This is right before the flood. This is God's assessment of the human race. Then the Lord saw, verse 5, then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was what? Great on the earth. And that every what? Intent of the thoughts of his heart was what? Only evil continually. I mean, it doesn't just say evil. It says only evil continually. That was man reaching, you know, the worst aspects, the most depraved aspects of his base fallen nature. And God had to wipe man out with the flood. And it says in the last days, it'll be like it was in the days of who? Noah, that's where it's headed, folks. And this is the world that we live in. So it's important that you cling to Jesus. Amen. Amen. Romans 3.12 says, all have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. 3.10 says that there's no one that seeks after God. Isaiah 64.6 says, we've all become like one who is unclean. I told you that that word is used of leprosy. Those who become unclean with leprosy. And all of our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf and our iniquities like the wind take us away. Remember a message I did a few weeks ago on the wedding garments and how they need garments that were white, right? But this says all of our righteousness is like what? Filthy garments. Do you remember what the word garment is right there? Filthy garments is from a word that means what? Menstrual rags. It got even worse. Do you remember I went to Joshua, the high priest in Zechariah chapter 3, and Satan was there accusing him because he had filthy garments on, but the word filthy there isn't used in menstrual cloths. It gets even worse. It, the word excrement's used. The word for excrement, that they were filthy, and it's a word used for human excrement. And it's like, wow, that's how our sin is before God. And it's like, why does God use those pictures? And by the way, if you come to Blessed Hope, you get it real, okay? We don't sugarcoat, amen? And we better not sugarcoat. We need to know who we are and how we need Jesus, amen? But when we think about it, why? And I mentioned briefly, I think in like eight seconds. It's because those things come from within the human being. With, they come from within and they come out and they are a picture of our sinful nature. Jesus' blood is the only blood that's pure, amen? Listen to what Jesus said about the human heart. When they were all upset because Jesus' disciples were eating out in the fields without washing their hands. Oh, they, you know, they made this big deal about, they didn't go through this ritual you know, cleaning their hands. And, and Jesus said that, he said in chapter 7, check this out, guys, verse 20 through 23. That which proceeds out of the man is that what defiles the man. For from within, out of the heart of man, proceed evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things proceed out from within and defile the man. Now, our body, bodily fluids are not evil in and of themselves. They're a picture of our inner being. But it's those wicked things in our hearts that come out that are sinful before God. The Bible talks about the stench of man's sin reaching the high heavens in Revelation before God judges the entire planet. It's actually in the process of judging them at that time, but then he's about ready to bring his final judgment. We have to realize... <laughs> We can't go to heaven how we are. We need to be forgiven, amen? We need to be changed. Remember Jer Jeremiah 17, 9? That's a scripture you might commit to memory. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Some translations, desperately sick. Who can know it? Verse 10 goes on to say that God looks into the heart. He alone can, can see the heart. We can't see the Adamanza's heart. They could, have, they could pray psychologist after psychologist and psychiatrist after psychiatrist trying to get people to understand Adam Lanza, and guess what? The Bible's already given us the verdict. We're all sinners, man. He was a terrible sinner. 
but only God could see the depths of that depravity. Jesus talked about darkness and the eye being full of darkness, and he said, how great is that darkness? Only the Lord ultimately can tell. We want, to, we want Jesus to take away our darkness, amen? We want us to give him to give us new hearts, new lives. The Bible says in Romans 8, 7, for the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. For it does not submit to God's law, indeed it cannot. So the wicked person, apart from the grace of Christ, does not submit to God's law, and indeed he what? Cannot. Without God's grace intervening in a sinner's life, they're going to continue to go astray. That's why it's important to pray for the lost, amen? That's why it's important to pray before you go witnessing, before you share the gospel. That's why it's important to pray in the morning when you wake up, Lord, help me to be a bright light. Help me when I'm out there at work or I'm out there wherever I'm at to, to shine the light of Jesus. Open hearts. Go ahead of me with your pre-regenerating grace, speaking to hearts before I even talk to people and set up divine appointments. Amen? And I believe we'll see more people come to Christ. How many of you know that when you pray for divine appointments, to me it blows me away. Every time I pray that prayer, it seems like without fail, all of a sudden I'm talking to somebody about the Lord. But I know it's times when I'm not praying that prayer as much. I'm not talking to people about the Lord as much. So it's important because the Bible says if you ask anything in accordance with God's will, you have it. Is it God's will that we witness the lost? Yes. Is it God's will that we impact people? Yes. Is it God's will that the lost be saved? Yes. So we pray, God, use me. Now, that doesn't mean everyone you talk to is going to get saved because God allows people in his permissive will, his permissive will is to allow people to make a choice, to say no to the gospel. We have to realize that those, pe those people who are outside of Christ, who don't know Christ, they can't do that which is good and please God. Did you know that? The Bible doesn't teach that the people that are not seeking God, that are doing their own thing, have so much good and so much bad, and they're really good people deep down, and, they, and they're, they're really blessing God with a lot of the behavior. They just need some of their sin to be taken care of. No, all of our righteousness is as what? Filthy rags. In fact, let me prove what I just said to you. And Hebrews 11, 6, it says, and without faith, without faith, it's impossible to what? Please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who diligently seek him. How about another one? Romans 14, 23. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats because eating is not from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. When the non-believer is doing things outside of faith and not Trusting God, not wanting to follow God, even if he helps an old lady cross the street. Guess what that is? It's not that that didn't bless the old lady. It's not that he genuinely wasn't trying to be nice. But in the midst of genuinely trying to be nice to the old lady, if he's not trusting God and refuses to turn to God, guess what he's doing? He's just another act of self-righteousness. I don't need you, God, to be righteous. I can, And that's what secular humanism is. And we can have our own moral code to ourselves, and we can have our own righteousness, and we don't need the righteousness that comes through Christ. And all the while, they're breaking God's moral law. The plowing of the wicked is sinful to God. I mean, if a wicked man might be plowing his fields, working really hard, but if he's in rebellion to God, all that plowing is for naught, ultimately. For himself and his own kingdom, his own empire. So we have to be really, really careful with the world standard of righteousness because the new world order coming under Antichrist will be faced on a self-righteousness, that we can have a kingdom without God. We can define what is right and wrong. And there's a whole new morality being taught through the government schools and everything else that people are being set up for. Gay marriage is okay. Certain drugs are okay. Illicit drugs that were once considered bad can be legal. You know, they're even trying to, some of them are trying to even justify pedophilia. We've warned about that for a long time. I just got a, a, a call from Chris Pinto, who co-produced with me a movie we did called The Kinsey Syndrome, which was picked up by Judith Reisman. We interviewed her, and she offers it. And she was on Ronald Reagan's commission with the Justice Department to investigate the effect of pornography, like Playboy, Hustler, these magazines that were popular in those days, in the 80s, Penthouse, and, and on, on pedophilia. And what she found, it astounded people. And a lot of people in the so-called free sex movement ridiculed her. Well, it's interesting that I just got a call from him because he got a call from her 
because in Croatia, somebody was showing our film, parts of our film. And a lot of people in Croatia were outraged because Kinsey's been getting, you know, being trumpeted as this great sex teacher in Croatia, and it exposes him as promoting pedophilia and actually using pedophilia in his experiments with kids. Really terrible stuff. And you know what happened? That guy's being prosecuted who showed parts of our, our film over there because he showed parts of our film exposing Kinsey. We need to give Reisman a written letter of permission that he's able to show our film. Of course he'd be able to show our film. But it was to keep him quiet. He, a lot of people started attacking him. There's a war, guys. Jesus said, that which is highly esteemed among men, I think it's Luke 16, 8, that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination to God. Don't confuse man's st- false standard of righteousness in the popular world and in the media with God's. Now, man has a conscience that God has given him that reflects the moral law, but the Bible warns that man can have a defiled conscience, that man in 1 Timothy 4 can sear his conscience, and that man can build for himself his own form of righteousness. And that's what happens in the world system in the end, because good will be called evil, and evil will be called good. And that's mentioned in Isaiah 5. That was happening in Isaiah's day in Isaiah chapter 5. However, we're told in the scripture in 2 Peter that just as the false prophets deceive the people, then false teachers will rise in our day. So the same thing's supposed to happen again, where they put light for darkness and darkness for light. Call good evil and evil good. And it says, in the last days, terrible times will come. Men will be lovers of self. It says, haters of that which is good. You're listening to a message by pastor and author Joe Schimmel on the Good Fight Radio Show. To learn more about Good Fight Ministries, please visit goodfightradio.org to find many of Pastor Joe's full Sunday morning teachings. How many of you have heard of H.G. Wells? How many of you have heard of the movie War of the Worlds? That was H.G. Wells. The Time Machine, that was H.G. Wells. He wrote over 100 books. 25 of his books are still in print. I mention him because he was an apostle of Charles Darwin. Uh, he was taught by Thomas Huxley. Thomas Huxley was Darwin's bulldog. They call him Darwin's bulldog because Darwin was very sickly, went to take the debate outside his home, uh, dealt with a lot of maladies, hearing voices or, or audio sounds and feeling like he was walking on air and all kinds of stuff he was going through. So, so Huxley was his bulldog because he tenaciously held to what Darwin taught and tried to bring it to the public. And they, you know, he was a dark, a man with very dark hair and flashing eyes, and, and, and uh, he really proliferated Darwin's doctrine of evolution. In fact, it's to Huxley that Darwin wrote a letter, and the postscript was thanking him for propagating the gospel, i.e., the devil's gospel, as Darwin called it. Oh, and it was and is the devil's gospel. But it's interesting because Huxley's student, one of his most famous students ever, was H.G. Wells. H.G. Wells talked about how Huxley had such an influence on him. In fact, he worked with Huxley's grandson, Julian Huxley. He had Alice Huxley and Julius Huxley with his grandsons. And by the way, Julian Huxley was the head of a humanist, a British humanistic, humanist society, secular humanism. H.G. Wells wrote all these books popularizing the idea of evolution, science fiction books and books on science. And he was way into sexual morality, felt the biblical... Warnings against sexual, sexual morality should not apply. We've all evolved. We're all evolved animals. He looked at man's human nature as not being fallen, but as something that's evolving. And he talked about a new world order coming. And he talked about eugenics. And he made Adolf Hitler look like a choir boy when it came to eugenics. Because he felt like whether you were inferior black, white, as he called it, dirty white, and Brown and these different races he lists to be put to death. And he wrote about this stuff. The, the weaker links and so forth in society, those who were, you know, incurable alcoholics should be put to death. He had all these different things. And then he was socialistic, he even became communistic. He renounced some of these things later, by the way. And after World War I, he was pushing for this new world order. I mean, one of his movies, War of the Worlds, was just made with Tom Cruise just a few years ago. And he was pushing for this new world order and talking about how human nature is good, Christianity is wrong, our nature is not fallen. And listen to what he said. Listen to what H.G. Uh, Wells said. He wrote, Can we doubt that presently our race will more than realize our boldest imaginations? Remember Genesis? Remember the Tower of Babel? 
while withholding them from doing what they imagine to do. That it will achieve unity and peace and that our children will live in a world made more splendid and lovely than any palace or garden that we know. Going on from strength to strength. You see, we're evolving to become something better, right? In an ever-widening circle of achievement, what man has done, the little triumphs of this present state are but the prelude to the things that man has yet to do. So while those are really glowing terms of humanity, right? Our kids are going to make a paradise on earth that blows away any palace and for our children and everything else. Well, guess what? He writes nine years later after seeing humanity for a little while and looking out his window a little more. And uh, this is from his book uh, that he wrote not long before he died called Mind at the End of Its Tether and of the Rope. The cold-blooded massacres of the defenseless, the return of deliberate and organized torture, mental torment, and the fear of a world from which such things had seemed well nigh banished has come near to breaking my spirit altogether. Homo sapiens, as he has been pleased to call himself, is played out. Wow. What happened to this grandiose picture of us making paradise on earth? Guess what happened to World War II? The very eugenics that he, tri- he triumphed, similar eugenics were practiced on six million Jews and many other people. The world went to war, and he realized that humanity was evil, although he had no reference as to what that evil really was about. And he saw the depravity of the human nature. That's pretty heavy when you contrast those two quotes, isn't it? Seems like you're reading two totally different men, but what happened was he got nine years more of experience. It's what happens when a lot of young people go to university and they're taught by their liberal professors that we're going to create a new world order and that man is the answer and that you don't need God and Dawkins is the answer. And When you look at Hitler killing, actually over 50 million people were killed in World War II. Over 100 million people by communists like Stalin and Mao and, and Pol Pot and others. And you know what? These men did not do what they did in a vacuum. They were influenced by others. Hitler was heavily influenced by Darwinism, what Nazism was called. Nazism means, in German, National Socialism. And his book, Mein Kampf, was about the survival of the fittest and applied Darwinism, social Darwinism. He took it to another level. We are going to find out who the fittest are. Men like Hitler, men like H.G. Wells, they thought, we're going to decide. We're not going to let nature just decide who's the fittest. We're going to help nature out because guess what? We can return to some animals, so we're going to help make sure we just wipe out all the evil people. Well, who they would deem as evil. And H.G. Wells thought that a master scientific elite should run things to create this new world. But you know what? Over 100 million people killed because of ideologies that came from Darwin, that came from Nietzsche, who was influenced by this whole Superman mentality, the German philosopher who said God is dead and wanted to build a Superman race. Celeste Crowley wants a, wanted a Superman race. Hitler wanted a Superman race. We're going to help evolution out when it's really devolution. And you know what's crazy to think? You can draw a line from men like Stalin and Hitler back to Nietzsche and Darwin. Now you have men that are far beyond Darwin like Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, militant atheist. And I wonder what kind of future leader these guys are influencing right now. Think about that one, guys. I wonder what men historians will draw a line from who kill mass people in the future back to Richard Dawkins because of his godless atheism. That's why we need Jesus, to save us from ourselves in our own sinful nature, in our own wickedness, amen? Amen. See, man has two major problems. One, we stand guilty before God. Number two, not only are we guilty before God and deserve hell because of our sinfulness, we have a fallen human nature that is bent on sin and rebellion against God. What's the answer? The gospel of Jesus Christ. Because it's through Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, amen? When Jesus died on the cross, what did he say? What's the Greek word that he yelled out that starts with a T? Anybody remember it? Tetelestai. What does tetelestai mean? It is finished, or it was an accounting term that meant what? Paid in full. He paid for all of our sins. We're in debt, man. 
We're guilty before God. We're in trouble. But he stepped in our place and he paid for all of our sins. That's a big deal, folks. He was buried, he rose again, conquered the grave. He became sin for us. In other words, he took the penalty of our sin. He didn't become a sinner, but he took the penalty of our sin that we could become the righteousness of God. We, there's the exchanged life. He took our penalty and we get his righteousness. He credited his righteousness to us. You see, when God looked in our spiritual bank account, what did he see? Were we in the red or not? Deep red, man. Then guess what happened? Now when God looks in, if we're trusting Jesus, paid in full, we're not in debt anymore. And guess what else is there? The righteousness of Christ. Because it says we become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. That he is our righteousness. Amen. So now we are in Christ and not in Adam, if you're a believer. Amen. Now you still have that fallen Adamic nature, but now you have the new Adamic nature from the second Adam, the resurrected Adam. Amen. The second Adam, the last Adam, as he's called. That's glorious. We have Christ in us, the hope of glory. We're partakers of the divine nature, and we can, we can submit to God and allow the Holy Spirit to live through us. It's no longer we that live, but Christ in us, Christ through us. Amen. And we can walk in the Spirit and be led of the Spirit. For as many as are led of the Spirit are the children of God. Amen. So praise God. There's the answer is Jesus. You've been listening to pastor and author Joe Schimmel on the Good Fight Radio Show. To learn more about Good Fight Ministries, please visit goodfightradio.org, where we feature many eye-popping and life-changing resources on DVD and CD, as well as an archive of previously aired shows. You can visit our podcast page at goodfightradio.org to find many of Pastor Joe's full Sunday morning teachings. If you've been blessed by this show and would like to share this blessing with others, you can help support our ministry by visiting our donate page also at goodfightradio.org. Or you can write to us at P.O. Box 2202, Simi Valley, California, 93062. Or call us toll-free at 1-866-JC-TRUTH. That's 1-866-528-7884. We thank you for tuning in. Join us next time on the Good Fight Radio Show. Love life, it comes down to just one thing.